In its earliest conception, David Lowry envisioned the medieval travelogue, a film that was not just content with, but delighted in the tedium of a night's journey, a film that gave little concern to narrative and character, a film that valued atmosphere above all else. And action. Of course, this is a far cry from the movie we eventually got, but the remnants of this idea remain. It was Lowry's decision to use Sir Gawain and the Green Knight as a template that transformed his idea into a full-blown adaptation. In his own words, It ceased to be this minimalist journey and became something far grander. But what of the poem? Despite being one of the most well-recognized Arthurian stories, little is known about how Sir Gawain and the Green Knight came to be. Dated to the tail end of the 14th century, it was written by the eponymous Pearl Poet, a title given to the unknown author of four medieval poems, Pearl, Cleanness, Patience, and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Together they form the Pearl Manuscript, or as known in academic circles, Cotton Nero A.X. Historians tend to agree it's miraculous that this document still exists, surviving more than 600 years in a fire no less but survived it has. All four poems are important Middle English pieces, formative for the culture and artistry of their time. But as I'm sure you can guess, I'll just be discussing the one. J.R.R. Tolkien once described Sir Gawain and the Green Knight as a window of many colored glass looking back into the Middle Ages. In other words, the poem serves as a sort of cultural touchstone, one that helped him and others alike to better understand the values and beliefs of that era. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is best described as a chivalric romance, written in alliterative verse and combining elements of Christian consciousness, Celtic folklore, and French romance. As its title suggests, the poem revolves around Sir Gawain, a knight errant of King Arthur's Round Table. On New Year's Eve, in the midst of celebration, a visitor arrives. The Green Knight. To King Arthur and his court, he proposes a challenge. O oh, greatest of kings, indulge me in this friendly Christmas game. Let whichever of your knights is oldest of blood and wildest of heart step forth, take up arms, and try with honor to land a blow against me. Whomsoever nicks me shall lay claim to this my arm. This glory and riches shall be thine. But thy champ must bind himself to this. Should he land a blow, then one year and your time hence, he must sit me out yonder, to the green chapel, six nights to the north. He shall find me there and bend a knee and let me strike him in return, be it a scratch on the check or a cut in the throat. I will return what was given to me, and then in trust and friendship we shall part. Who then? Who is willing to engage with me? Gawain accepts, and so begins the beheading game a motif prevalent in much of European literature, including Brickeroo's Feast and the life of Caradoc, the latter of which shares many similarities with Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, so much so in fact that some scholars consider it a direct source of inspiration. Unlike the film we're soon to discuss, the poem pays relatively little attention to Gawain's adventuring. Indeed, after accepting the challenge, it's just a few stanzas later that we happen upon Lord Bertalanck's castle, and it's here where we find the second main component of this poem, the exchange of winnings. Let us make a promise to each other. 
I hunt tomorrow and the day after. Whatever the forest offers me, I will bring you home the best. And you will give me, in turn, whatever you might receive here. What might I receive here that is not already yours? Who knows? This house is full of strange things. But then again, I see things everywhere that bear no logic. Here, the structure of the poem becomes interlaced, moving from hunt to bed and back again. Each morning, the Lord goes out on a hunt, and each morning, the lady makes an advance. It's this test of truth that'll prove the hardest for Gawain, forcing him to toe the line between chivalric demands of chastity and courtesy. To honor both and fulfill his bargain, he receives from the lady a kiss, a kiss he gives back to the Lord each night. The deer, the boar, the fox. Three hunts and three attempts at seduction. While I'm sure a more in-depth connection could be made, it might be best to look at this in broad strokes. The first represents apprehension, both from the deer being hunted and from Gawain's reaction to the lady's advances. The second, ferocity. The boar is a mighty beast, the hardest for Lord Bertilak to kill. Compare that to Gawain's determination, a desperate attempt to uphold both his chastity and courtesy without sacrificing either. Finally, deceit. As is often the case in Western literature, the fox here is synonymous with deception and cunning, and Gawain's actions are emblematic of just that. In their final encounter, Lady Bertilak pleads with Gawain to take a gift, a green girdle said to protect him from harm shifting his dilemma to that of honesty versus safety. And in the interest of self-preservation, he accepts. It's Gawain's decision not to disclose this gift to Lord Bertilak, thereby breaking his vow, that cements his moral failing. It's this part of the poem that lends itself well to proto-feminist and homoerotic interpretations. Lady Bertilak, for example, is an active agent, holding power over Gawain in her attempts to seduce him. On the other hand, Gawain's embracing and kissing of Lord Bertilak blurs the line between homosocial and homosexual expression. Of course, there are other examples and counterexamples too, but more on these interpretations later. After leaving the Lord's castle, Gawain is escorted to the Green Chapel. There, he finds none other than the Green Knight, and receives three blows from his axe. On the first, Gawain flinches, a measure of his cowardice. The second is a feint, another test of Gawain's courage. The third blow strikes true, but Gawain receives no more than a nick, punishment for breaking his vow. Then, a number of reveals. The Green Knight and Lord Bertilak are one and the same, and it's Morgan Le Fay behind the challenge and enchantment. To the Green Knight, a nick is punishment enough. He absolves Gawain of his failure, declaring him the most blameless knight in all the land. Well done, my brave knight. And it works because the Gawain of this poem is the most courteous. A person characterized by his nobleness, humbleness, grace, and compassion, he is the epitome of what it means to be a chivalrous knight, while at the same time, not without his doubts and fears. It's a hard line to straddle. Here's a Gawain that's not just an inspirational character, but a relatable one at that. However, the seriousness of Gawain's moral fault is by no means a settled debate. The poem itself offers various different judgments, none of which are mutually exclusive. Gawain's rigorous self-critique, Lord Bertilak's stern but understanding criticism, and rejoicement, perhaps even acceptance, from King Arthur and his round table. The latter of the three is the note on which this poem ends. All the characters of the round table don a green sash in Gawain's honor, a reminder to always be honest. Arthurian legend is no stranger to reinterpretation, nor should it be. It's a literary cycle that has not only survived, but thrived on retelling and adaptation throughout the ages. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, in particular, has inspired plenty of modern-day interpretations, and with David Lowry's The Green Knight, we have the latest of such. The opening title cards are shown in a number of different fonts, perhaps calling attention to the number of different literary sources and translations this film pulls from. In addition, there are creative decisions that Lowry makes to divorce this film from any singular source material. Gawain is pronounced many different ways. Bring young Garwin here. Because you are brave Sir Gawain. Oh, fear not, Sir Gawain. You're Gawain, aren't you? Uh. You must be mistaken. Characters are stripped of their names, 
and certain set pieces are taken from centuries ahead of time. Different as it may be, which is significantly so, Lowry acknowledges where his work stands relative to the original. Don't tell anyone this. Sometimes when I see room for improvements, I make them. Then, The Green Knight is an amalgamation of sorts, combining characters, changing motivations, and dropping narrative threads. The most fundamental, immediate difference is with Gawain himself, who in Lowry's version goes on a journey of self-discovery rather than self-preservation. It's this initial repositioning that changes most of what's to come. If the Gawain of the poem is the most chivalrous, a character learning how to fail, then the Gawain of the film is a kind of inverse, a character learning how to live with honor. Unlike his counterpart, this Gawain is no knight, at least not yet. You're a knight, aren't you? Do I look like one? You look like any knight I ever saw. Everything he does is done in half measure, wanting the appearance of knighthood rather than the commitment that comes along with it. Gawain, while not entirely dishonorable, isn't far from it. One could argue he fails every test of virtue up until the end. It's at this final confrontation with the Green Knight that he decides to do the right thing, having imagined and decided against a lifetime of dishonorable choices. But we'll get there. For now, understand that Lowry's adaptation is what you might call a modernized reworking. Of course, that'll mean different things to different people, but I do think Lowry's changes and overall direction help make his film feel timely and sleek. Complete faithfulness was never the goal, and whether that's good or bad is up to you. For me though, I think it works. The opening serves a number of important roles, introducing us to this world, to its magic, and setting the stage for what's to come. And of all who reign all, none had renown, like the boy who pulled sword from stone. But this is not that king, nor is this his soul. This was the original first shot of the movie. So in my, in my mind, this is still the first shot of the film. It's meant to evoke the siege of Troy and, like in the poem's first stanza, trace that event's lineage to the time of King Arthur. And as we pull into Gawain, the film pulls away from the poem's text, if not in letter, then in spirit. Christ is born. Christ is born indeed. As I mentioned earlier, the Gawain of this film begins his journey in a much different place, a point in his life far removed from that of the poem. Our first location being a brothel is quite telling. Not to mention, Gawain's insistence on paying Essel is a pretty clear indication of how he views their relationship. From the get-go, we understand a lot about Gawain's moral character. It's more than just a lack of title. He is no knight. From here on, the film is divided into nine separate chapters, beginning first with the Christmas game. Just like the poem, the Green Knight arrives during the celebration, bringing us our Christmas colors, from the green of his bark and the red of his blood. Unlike the poem, the Green Knight is summoned by Gawain's mother, and Gawain's decision to behead the Green Knight seems to be motivated more out of selfishness than honor. The rules of this game do not require a beheading. Gawain could have given him a nick or a scratch, but he does not. He wants a story to tell, and he wants it now. The Green Knight is also quite the departure from the story's previous filmed adaptations. My challenge is simple. Let any man among you, worthy of the deed, take up my axe and hack the head from off my shoulders. Beyond just a point of comparison, I think this footage might clue us in to some other important changes. In these older films, based on the poem's description, the Green Knight is a resplendent, towering figure, decked out in jewels and other adornments to rival that of Camelot itself. 
He is the embodiment of nature and death. Now, live on, Sir Gawain. However, in Lowry's version, the Green Knight is more tree than man, honing into the character's vestigial pagan roots. It lends itself well to the theme of Christianity versus paganism, one that the film will revisit time and again. Regardless, this much is clear. Gawain has agreed at the beheading game, and in one year hence, he'll meet his destiny at the Green Chapel. Fast forward to nearly one year later, and Gawain hasn't done much, other than lays about and leech off the renown that the beheading has brought him. Gawain wants the appearance of knighthood, rather than the commitment that comes along with it. It's a visage that he wishes he had. The rest of the chapter is concerned with Gawain's preparations. Larry uses this opportunity to introduce us to the Green Sash, establishing Morgan Le Fay and her magic much earlier than the poem. In addition, this chapter also pays special attention to Gawain's covenant, reminding us of his Christian vow. Five wits, five fingers, five points. The pentangle represents the holy truth, a composite of qualities that all virtuous knights should possess. Friendship, generosity, chastity, courtesy, and piety. All present in some form along Gawain's journey, and all broken in one way or another. I mentioned earlier that The Green Knight began as an atmospheric travelogue. It's that initial focus that helped guide this film into what it finally became, a movie that seeks to immerse its viewers in Gawain's journey. It nails down a hard-to-achieve rhythm, marrying, as Lowry describes, his maximalist instincts with his fondness for minimalism. And nowhere is that more evident than in this chapter. The Journey Out it's filled to the brim with long takes and mundane activities, a sharp departure from the film's first 30 minutes. Take for example Gawain riding out from Camelot. It's our first long, unbroken take, and does well to establish the scale of this setting. In addition, Lowry spends a considerable amount of time showing us the world around and outside of Gawain's concern, contrasting his inner struggle with environmental destruction, war, and other existential threats. Ours is a Camelot in decline, deglamorized, demoralized, and demythologized. Even its magic is leaving the world behind. We had the idea kind of early on that we wanted Camelot to feel like, um, you know, civilization at its worst. This chapter is Gawain's first real test, and subsequently, his first moral failure. It's a question of generosity. Gawain is willing to give, but only after being prompted. And regardless, it just torn't enough. Gawain's subsequent capture is a failure on multiple parts, impressing the idea that he's unable to live up to the chivalric code. The breaking of his shield represents the breaking of his covenant, and the scavenger's insistence to finish his quest for him is a measure of Gawain's worth. This is also a great time to dive into the film's technicals. Lowry pays special care to the film's visual language, a constant reminder of time and mortality. And it's in this scene that both first impose themselves. As the seasons change in rotation, so too does the camera, now a panorama of Gawain's surroundings. It revolves in a clockwise, 360 degree revolution, resting on his skeletal remains, a reality where he never fought back. And, as he contemplates this outcome, the camera revolves back in the other direction, resting again on Gawain as he commits to living, to finishing his quest. This kind of camera work will come up again later as a recurring visual motif, but the interesting cinematography doesn't end here. The Green Knight as a whole is filled to the brim with inspired visual choices and creative flair. Wide frame shots with a near 180 degree field of view, 65mm close-ups with soft fall-off, and dream sequences shot on a lens with heavy vignette and smeared Vaseline. For Lowry and his DP, Andrew Droz Palermo, their goal was to create something that felt both dynamic and three-dimensional. The 
Gawain's next encounter is with St. Winifred, a Welsh woman venerated in the 12th century. According to legend, she was pursued and beheaded by her suitor, at which point a healing spring was said to have appeared. Some time later, her head was found and rejoined to her body, restoring her back to life. Opinions differ, but there's a chance the poem makes a passing mention to St. Winifred's well. And if so, Lowry takes that reference and expands upon it, echoing parts of the original legend. I've lost something as well. Will you help me find it? What are you doing? Do not touch me. The knight should know better. On one hand, you can look at this scene as Gawain reaching out to confirm whether Winifred is real. On the other hand, it's an inappropriate way for Gawain to conduct himself. So again, Gawain breaks his virtue, first by trying to touch Winifred without her permission, and second by asking for a reward. Why would you ask me that? Why would you ever ask me that? Ultimately though, Gawain goes through with her request. The interlude serves a similar function to the journey out, with just as many scenes of Gawain traveling across the land. The difference this time, however, is that it comes with a surreal bent. Gawain makes official with his traveling fox companion, experiences a series of hallucinations, and encounters some giants. Again, a minor reference from that of the poem, and again, a test of Gawain's virtue. Here, he asks for a ride across the valley literally trying to stand on the shoulder of giants. But the fox howls at them, preventing Gawain from cheating his quest. Gawain's arrival at the Lord and Lady's castle feels like a significant departure from the film up till now, both in time and place. If the previous chapter felt a tinge surreal, then I'd argue this one is full blown. The interior and exterior shots are from a hodgepodge of different castles and manors, each from a range of different time periods, up to and including the 18th century. The production and set design add to this otherworldly, dreamlike feel, with bed curtains that seem to stretch on forever, or the use of camera obscura centuries in advance. I don't think it's coincidence that this location is the most affluent and well-lit interior that we've seen, a sharp contrast to the bleak and barren Camelot. This isn't even to mention the soundtrack, which throughout this film has been a mix of medieval instrumentation, old English choir, and pulsing electronica. All these elements come to a head in this chapter, which to me is the most surreal and esoteric one this film has to offer. After fainting, Gawain wakes up in an unfamiliar bed. It's this scene that the film reintroduces us to two important readings. The same two I said we'd circle back to earlier. We're reminded that Gawain's mother is behind all of this, and we're given the slightest hint of sexual tension between Gawain and the Lord. Oh, fear not, Sir Gawain. You only slept through the night. In the following sequence, we're introduced to the lady and the crone, the former of whom is played by the same actor as Gawain's girlfriend, Essel. It's no coincidence that the one who tempts Gawain's chastity has a familiar face, calling into question Gawain's moral character. It's not Essel's person that he can't commit to, it's her lack of social status. The exchange of winnings in this film has the same rules to that of the poem. The Lord will give Gawain whatever he hunts, and Gawain will give the Lord whatever he receives in the house. In the poem, the scenes of Gawain at the manor are interlaced, bouncing between seduction and hunt. However, Lowry, in the interest of sticking with Gawain's point of view, removed the hunting scenes, choosing instead to allude to them through painting or by bringing them to Gawain directly. It's also at this point in the film that we get a direct assessment of the Green Knight and all that he represents. Why is it green, do you think? The knight? Yes. Was he born that way? Perhaps it is the color of his blood when he blushes. But why green? Why not blue? Or red? Because he's not of this earth. But green is the color of earth, of living things, of life. And of rot. Yes. Yes. 
We deck our halls with it and dye our linens. But should it come creeping up the cobbles, we scrub it out fast as we can. When it blooms beneath our skin, we bleed it out. And when we together all find that our reach has succeeded our grass, We stamp it out, we spread ourselves atop it and smother it beneath our bellies, but it comes back. It does not dally, nor does it wait to plot or conspire, pull it out by the roads one day, and the next there it is, creeping in around the edges. Whilst we're off looking for red, here comes green. Red is the color of lust, but green is what lust leaves behind. In heart, in wound. Green is what is left when art our fades, when passion dies, when we die too. When you go, your footprints will fill with grass. Moss shall cover your tombstone, and as the sun rises, green shall spread over all. In all its shades and hues. This verdict we will overtake your swords and your coins and your battlements, and try as you might, all you hold dear will succumb to it. Your skin, your bones, your virtue. The Green Knight subverts traditional medieval depictions. It positions its woman characters in better roles than that of Gawain, of more prowess, more power, and more virtue. Why is goodness not enough? It problematizes Gawain's behavior toward Essel and Winifred, and taken further, could be considered a representation of toxic masculinity. His is a character that resorts to violent impulse and emotional repression, unwilling to be affectionate or committed in his relationship. And as mentioned so many times before, the Gawain of this film is much different to that of the poem. He's a person that desires glory but doesn't know how to earn it. So it should come as no surprise that he fails this test too. Unable to maintain both his chastity and courtesy, he gives in to the lady's seduction and only pays the lord back with a kiss, not the sash. When it comes to the homosocial and homosexual interpretations of the film, this is one of the most important scenes we're given, and I think there's two main readings. To start first with the most uncharitable, this scene could come across as an act of coercion. Everything seems a little uneasy, and Gawain looks to be uncomfortable with what's happening. Add to that the surrounding context of this scene, Gawain running from another potential act of coercion and shame, the dead boar, the forest, the captured fox, and the difference in position and power a host to his guest, and mounted versus standing. But I think there's another way you can read this. In the poem, some interpretations of the kisses between the Lord and Gawain view them as purely ritualistic. There's also the greater context of similar rituals in other medieval texts. The idea being that for the poem, this wasn't intended to be a homosexual expression. On the other hand, some scholars view the lines between homosocial and homosexual as being blurred. After all, the implication is that should Gawain have engaged in a sexual act with the lady, he would have had to pay it back to the Lord. Regardless, I don't think intent is super important. The Gawain poet is dead and will never know. If people can find queer representation in this poem, then that's equally valid. So, circling back to the film, I think the scene between Gawain and the Lord can be read as such. The scene might start out as menacing, but once the Lord's intent becomes clear, it rapidly shifts. The color is much warmer, and the soundtrack changes to a more hopeful tune. I think Gawain's reaction is not so much out of disgust, but rather discomfort with a potential attraction. I think it's telling that this scene is the only true kiss in the movie, not to mention it comes with the added context of previous scenes. Christmas Eve. It will be a good day, and the next day even better. I'm 
Sasha. Are you afraid? Of what might happen? Do I see myself sitting here a year from now? Telling you the tale of my encounter with the Green Knight. I can see that more clearly than death at his hand, but um, when I try to draw the line from here to there. Stop I... drawing lines. Perhaps that would help. Would you like me to face him with you? I will, if you would like it. Would you? Say the words. I would like that very much. Gawain's decision to move on should come as no surprise. He has a quest to finish, and he spent the entire film running away from intimacy. Before leaving, the Lord gives Gawain his final gift. And so, beyond what I previously mentioned, this scene also acts as a quick summation of the boar and fox hunts from the poem. Gawain has spent his entire journey struggling between a number of binaries, including Christianity and paganism, honesty and dishonesty, and many more. One of his most prevalent is trying to decide whether to run home or to finish his quest. It's in these final two chapters that his resolve regarding that struggle will be most tested. In the poem, servants take Gawain to the chapel, but Lowry didn't want to introduce another character, giving the role to Gawain's fox companion instead. Some see them as their own separate entity, others as another embodiment of Morgan Le Fay. Taken at their word though, I think it's the former, perhaps another test of Gawain's virtue. It was a gift. No need for gifts where you hide it. Upon Gawain's arrival at the Green Chapel, he presents the Green Knight's axe at his feet and waits. Overnight, he notices a change. The Green Knight is someone you know. It's everyone he knows, a summation of all of his trials and tribulations. Everything has led up to this one point, this one decision he's about to make. It's the film's most pivotal moment, and Gawain chooses to run. Much earlier, I mentioned that Gawain is a character who fails in half measures, but what does that mean exactly? Looking back at each of his encounters and tests, Gawain doesn't fail them completely. Take for example a meeting with Saint Winifred. Gawain is asked to find her head. Sure, he first asks for a reward, but still completes the task afterward. It's this partial success that keeps Gawain relatable. He's not entirely dishonorable, and as we're about to find out, still redeemable. The following sequence, roughly 15 minutes long, is Gawain imagining his future, imagining a reality where he continued down his dishonorable and unchivalrous path. It's a dream sequence, chained together with overlapping audio, fourth wall breaks as characters look on into other scenes, and not one word spoken of dialogue. If Camelot was in decline before, then this feature shows it in complete freefall. The final scene in this sequence revisits the film's most prominent motifs, drenching the room in green and making one final revolution. As the camera rests again on Gawain, he's alone. Abandoned by everyone and everything, time and mortality has finally caught up to him. Having imagined his potential future, Gawain finally decides to do the honorable thing, owning up to his morals and covenant. He takes off the sash, and accepts whatever fate decides. Yeah. Now I'm ready. I'm ready now. Before we end, there are a few things that we should discuss. It's important to understand that both the film and poem are the kind of works to encourage multiple different interpretations. Take Morgan Le Fay, for example. If the story is about Gawain's coming of age, then her role in Gawain's quest is to make sure he matures. This is a Morgan Le Fay that would conspire with King Arthur, a Morgan Le Fay that would want her son to grow up. An alternate interpretation might think differently, that the Green Knight was always meant to challenge King Arthur, and Gawain's involvement was never intended. That Morgan Le Fay gave Gawain the sash, 
to protect him from her mistake. Even the ending is meant to be ambiguous. Does the Green Knight kill Gawain, subverting the monomyth and sealing his fate? Or does Gawain come home, returning to Camelot a better man? In early versions of the script, Lowry considered a number of deviations, even more extreme than what was in the final film. One had the Green Knight as a woman, one had King Arthur and Queen Guinevere, played by the same actor, one even had Gawain slain halfway through the film, with his quest taken up by his sister. When it comes to adaptation, I don't think it's necessary to be completely faithful. I understand that people come in with strong expectations about what this should be, but 100% adherence to original text would rob this cast and crew of their creative input, removing their own signature on this story and its characters. And honestly, what better way to honor Arthurian lore than through reinterpretation, something it's experienced constantly since it was first conceived. Whether the Green Knight is good or bad is subjective and up to you, but I think it's a perfect example of what it means to modernize a classic story. And at its core, both film and poem seem to agree on at least one thematic message, the importance of living with honor. Thank you for watching. It laid me low, and I have to give many thanks to my collaborators who put up with many months of me just being very sad and editing the movie and, and being, you know, I, I worked on it every day for, you know, well over a year, just on the edit. And I never stopped being convinced that there was something in there that I could draw out from it, but I also was convinced that it was a failure at the same time. And I have a lot of good friends who had to listen to me complain about it. And I will take this moment to apologize to them and thank them for still being my friends in spite of the misery that I probably just like espoused to them for far too long a period of time. And so now, looking at it now, I feel nothing but affection for it.